Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Well, hey there, everybody. How we doing? Good. It's, fam it's family service, and these are some of my favorite services ever because I get to act ridiculous, and it's like culturally acceptable. So I hope you're ready for some fun today. Uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to be talking about the idea of forgiveness, uh, of forgiveness. And so if this is a sore subject for you, buckle in. Uh, but for the rest of us, we're going to be going through a passage in the Scripture, uh, a parable. We're in this series called Story Times, and it's all about the parables that Jesus used to teach us things about himself and about how to follow him. And, uh, and so we are going to look at a parable called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, Jesus didn't call it that. We gave it that title. So it kind of gives away the whole message, right? We've got an unforgiving servant. But we're going to go through it anyway. And I need volunteers. Like I need helpers. All right. So I need somebody who is willing uh, to help. And so this is like the participatory part of the, uh, of the day. I need somebody who uh, and I actually already talked to one person. So Colin, why don't you come on up? Colin, I got one already. This is, this, he, Colin is, is going to be our king. Everyone said hi, King Colin. All right. I now dub the King Colin of Boulevard. And what you say now goes. All right, you ready for this? All right, here's your crown. There you go. All right, King, I'm going to have you stand over here. I need a servant. I need someone who's willing to be a servant. Awesome. You back there. All right, come on up. Come on up. All right. Let's see here. Here we go. Tell everybody your name. Hi, I'm Abby. Hi, Abby. Everybody say hi, Abby. All right, let me get this here for you. We got yours. Your outfit isn't as fancy as the King's. I'm sorry, uh, but you're a servant, and that's well. That's kind of just what it, what the deal is. Come on up. All right, now I, I need like an adult. I need an adult to help me out. I, let's not just make this all about the kids. I need an adult. Who's gonna help me be my adult servant? Uh, yeah, come on, come on up. I'll take you. Come on. All right, come on up. All right, I got another servant. Tell everybody your name. Josh. Hi, Josh. Everybody say hi, Josh. Awesome, Josh. Thank you for being, thank you for being a servant today. Don't worry about it. We won't use it again. Come on. Uh, all right. Uh, I need, I need some police officers though. I need some, I need some police. Uh, yeah. Come on up. Uh, you come on up. Yep. Uh, yep. Come on up. All right. We've got some police officers. Come on. And I've only got one pair of handcuffs, so you're gonna have to, I don't know, rock paper scissors for that while you're over there. Tell everybody your name. Tell everybody your name. Gavin. Gavin. Savannah. Kyron. Kyron. Nice to meet you. Everybody say hi, police. Perfect. So here you go. Here's your, here's your cuffs. All right. And then I'm going to have you guys come over, over here and stand over here. You're going to come into play later. All right. So you're going to be over here. Uh, I, I didn't tell you this part. This is a very important part, though. Um, you're kind of the bad guy. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? You're kind of the bad guy. You can, Josh, you can just kind of hang out over here, all right? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this passage in Scripture. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 18, you can. We're going to start in verse 23. And uh, you might notice a few differences in, uh, in this passage and what we're about to act out on stage, um, mainly because uh, I, uh, I read this from the Randy Revised version of the Bible, uh, which uh, basically I just kind of added stuff that I thought might be, uh, that might make it uh, a little funny. Are, you, are we cool with that? Are we cool to kind of go through the story of the unforgiving servant and, and we're going to act it out. We're going to have some fun. Now, just because these guys are the ones acting on a stage, you still have a part to play, okay? So whenever I say, and all the people said something, you got to repeat after me. Are y'all willing to do that? Okay, very good. Now, guys, if you, if I ask, I'm going to tell you to like say stuff and you'll, you'll like repeat after me. Well, when, when that happens, I mean, you got to kind of do it the way uh, I say to do it. So like if I tell you to yell something and you just kind of whisper it, I'm going to make you do it again. All right. You cool with that? All right. So come on. You're up here. Front and center. Front and center. All right. There once was a servant. Everyone say hi, servant. Hi, servant. Perfect. There once was a servant who loved Taco Bell. 
She loved Taco Bell so much that she ate it every day. In fact, she loved Taco Bell so much that she borrowed quite a bit of money from the king to eat it every day. She was in a lot of debt, and all the people said, "Uh uh-oh. Okay, enter the king. Come here, King Colin. Here we go. The king, the king also loved Taco Bell. He, he loved Taco Bell so much that he wanted to own a bunch of Taco Bells. Just one problem. He needed money. It just so happened that a servant of his owed him quite a bit of money. Billions, actually, with a B. So the king went to the one place he knew he would find his servant. Taco Bell. That's right. All right. Come here. So here we go. We're at Taco Bell. So he just so happened to meet his servant on the way. So he confronted the servant. He said, hey, man. Hey, man. You owe me some money. You owe me some money. I want my money now. I want my money now. Not later now. Not later now. All right. And all the people said, yeah. 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 I mean, she owes billions. That's a lot of money. Okay. The servant said, okay, here. I I forgot this part. There's that. Okay. Uh, Ten bucks. Okay. So the servant said, well, I only have 10 bucks. I only have 10 bucks. And I was just about to buy a Nacho Bel Grande. And I was about to... <laughs> buy, a, buy a Nacho Bel Grande. About to buy a Nacho Grande. Yeah. I don't have your money. I don't have your money. Well, the, this made the king mad. Everybody say, uh-oh. <laughs> the king snatched the 10 bucks. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and said, then I'm throwing your butt in the slammer. Yeah, I'm throwing your butt in the slammer. Until you can pay me my money. Until you can pay me my money. I have Taco Bells to buy. I have Taco Bells to buy. Very good. All right. The servant begged and pleaded. Oh, no, no, no. I mean really begged and pleaded. So I'm, come, come on. <laughs> begged and pleaded. Come on. Come on. Do it. Don't make me do it by myself. Oh, All right. please. please don't throw me in the slammer. Please don't. Throw me in the slammer. I would be ruined. I would be ruined. I will pay you back, I promise. I will pay you back, I promise. Just give me time. Just give me time. And all the people said, oh. oh. All right, go ahead and stand up. Well, the king's heart was softened toward his servant because of his pleading and also because of the smell of chalupas in the air. <laughs> he decided not to throw his servant in the slammer. In fact, he completely forgave the debt. Everyone say yay! Yay! The king wiped her slate clean. The servant was relieved so much that she said, I'm relieved. I'm relieved. Very good. Very good. All right. Here we go. Page two. Page two. All right. Fast forward 20 minutes. King, you can go have, you can go sit just kind of on your throne over there by the drums. There you go. All right. Fast forward 20 minutes. And this is where you're going to come in, Josh. All right, you ready for your part? Okay. Fast forward 20 minutes. The servant never got her Taco Bell. And now her tummy is upset. She needs a Nacho Bell Grande, and she needs it now. (laughs) So much so that she exclaimed, I need a Nacho Bell Grande now. I need a Nacho... (laughs) Bell, Bell, you can just read it. Nacho Bell Grande now. I need a Nacho Grande now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. The servant sees someone down the road. It's a buddy who owes her a hundred bucks. And so she yells out to the buddy, here, Josh, come on over here. Come on over here. You're you're walking down the road. And she says, she says, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. uh, I need my hundred bucks. I need my hundred bucks. And I need it now. I need it now. Well, buddy was nervous and all the people said, "Uh uh-oh. He only had 10 bucks to his name. Here you go. There's your 10 bucks. Okay. All right. He only had 10 bucks to his name. He didn't have a hundred bucks to pay her. So he pleaded with the servant, said, look, look, I only have 10 bucks to my name. I only have 10 bucks to my name. I don't have your hundred bucks. I don't have a hundred dollars. Please have mercy on me. Please, please show mercy. I promise I will pay you back. I'll give it back to you tomorrow. Okay. (laughs) Well, the servant's tummy grumbled and her rage grew. She yelled at her buddy, no, I need my money now. No, I need my money now. I'm taking your 10 bucks. I'm taking your 10 bucks. And I'm throwing you in the slammer. I'm throwing you in the slammer. Until you pay me back. Until you pay me back. I need a Nacho Bell Grande. I need a Nacho Bell. Yeah, that thing. Okay. So the servant, so the servant yelled for the police. Police! 
All right, come on, guys, this is your part. This is your part. All right. And they took the buddy to the slammer. All right, so cuff him up. Cuff him up and take him to the slammer. Take him to jail. Everybody say, oh. All right. The buddy cried and begged for mercy. Oh, wrong way. So jail's over here. Jail's over here. Jail's over here. Yeah, we got bars and everything. I mean, he's not getting out of there. He's not getting out of there. Please, please stop him. Don't let him take me away. Yeah. But the servant wanted no part of it. She only wanted her Nacho Bell Grande. And now she had 10 bucks. Off to Taco Bell she went. All right, come on. So here you go. Here's your, here is Taco Bell right here. And guess what is waiting for you? A glorious Nacho Bell Grande. She was excited about getting her Nacho Bell Grande. So much so that she yelled, I'm so excited about this Nacho Bell Grande. I'm so excited about this Nacho Bell Grande. Yeah. Woo! She started eating her nacho bel grande. That's not eating. I mean, you need, come on. I mean, it's just nachos and cheese, man. Come on. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I'm, you faked it. I mean, this is acting. All right. That's all right. That's all right. Just then, just then, the king busted into the Taco Bell. Come on. You got to bust in. Yeah. All right. He had been told by some of the other servants about what happened. He was furious, so much so that he shouted, I'm furious. I'm furious. All right. He said to the servant, I can't believe you did that to your buddy. I can't believe you did that to your buddy. He only owed you a hundred bucks. He only owed you a hundred bucks. But you threw him in the slammer. But you threw him in in the slammer. You owed me billions. You owed me billions. And I forgave it. And I forgave it. You wicked servant. You wicked servant. You don't deserve a Nacho Bell Grande. You don't deserve a Nacho Bell Grande. You don't deserve Taco Bell at all. You don't deserve Taco Bell at all. In fact, you deserve to be in the slammer. You deserve to be in the slammer. That's right. Take them away, boys. There you go. So the police came and took away the servant and threw him in the slammer. And all the people said, take that. The king, though, King was still angry, but then his stomach growled. And right there stood a half eaten Nacho Bel Grande. <laughs> the king was instantly happy again. Here, show everybody how happy you are. There you go. All right, everybody give my actors a head. Awesome. Good job. All right, guys, you're done. Head on down. Let me, here, I'll, uh, I'll help you out here and get you out of this. You can just take your outfit off and just throw it on the ground there. There you go. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Y'all are the best. Oh, I get my 10 bucks back. Sweet. All right. Here. Hey, Colin, you want your, you want your nachos? There you go. You get like a movie snack. How about that? There you go. Sorry, Josh and Tristan. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, man. See, that's why you ask your friends' kids to do stuff is because then they can't really get mad at you when you give them things, you know? They're your friends. They have to forgive you. That's what we're talking about today. Hey, uh, you might have noticed there's maybe some differences in your Bible as what I read in my Bible. Uh, And so why don't we actually read the actual passage that we're going to talk through today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead. Matthew 18. Uh, We're going to start there. If you don't have your Bibles, open up your phone. Open up the Bible app on your phone. And if you don't have that, we'll have it up on the screens. But I'd love for you to be able to read along with us this morning uh, as we see what God wants to teach us today. And kids, just because we finished like the acting part and adults, doesn't mean you get to check out now, all right? Here's here's where we're going to kind of dig in and really learn what God wants to teach us, okay? So here we are, uh, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 23, and Jesus is telling his disciples this story. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And we'll get to how much that is in here in a moment. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. 
But he refused, and he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went on and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now there's a, cool, there's a few things here in this passage that I think are really intriguing. And the first is, remember, we got to that 10,000 talents part. Um, I wanted to kind of like dig in. And so I was like researching, like how much money is that? Like 10,000 talents. I mean, it sounds like, you know, 10,000 bucks, that's a lot. Uh, except this is way, way more than that. Um, the, best, the best research that I could find as they were looking at uh, what a talent would have been measured in back in biblical times to what that would be worth now in today's money, uh, best thing I could find was an article from a year ago in, in 2021 in April that said uh, that that amount of money, 10,000 talents, would have been worth $3.48 billion with a B. $3.48 billion. It said 60 million approximately days of wages. You don't have enough of those. <laughs> that is a debt that you could never repay. Now, I don't know, some of y'all might be balling, <laughs> um, and I know some people that are, that are well off. I don't know anybody 3.48 billion well off. No one would have been able to repay that debt, especially not a servant, because they remember what's implied here by someone working as a servant. They're not making very much, right? $3.48 billion in debt. That is a lot of money. And I'm not sure, like, here's what we have to remember about the parables. Like, these parables aren't things that actually happened. This is not a historical event. This is a story that Jesus was telling his disciples to teach them something about himself or how to follow him, okay? But for, but for today, let's just kind of play this out as the story tells us, right? Someone is $3.48 billion in net. I'm not sure any one person is ever going to loan another person $3.48 billion. I'm not sure Elon Musk, even if we're like best buds, uh, which, hey, that would be cool if I just walked up and said, hey, can I have like a cool $3.48 billion, you know, just to like hang on to for a little bit? And then he scrounges around in his couches and he's like, hey, look what I found. Here you go. Uh, even then, I don't think, I don't think he's handing me that money. And instead, what probably happened uh, was this was probably over like a period of time, right? I mean, he probably, hey, I need, I got to pay off my house. I got to pay off my car. I got to pay off whatever. And he continues to borrow money or borrow money. Maybe, maybe he had some kind of issue, right? He just continues to borrow money over and over and over and over again. All right, he gets himself uh, in this hole. And notice that there is wrath there. Like, look, um, uh, look at verse 25. It says, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So this wasn't like the servant, or, I mean, the king is not just like, ah, I'm out 3.48 billion, man. Like, dude, I'm, that stinks, you're fired. Uh, no, he has him thrown uh, it, to be sold as a slave and his wife and his kids sell everything he's got so that I can recoup some of what I'm owed. The king is not happy about this. There is some extreme wrath there. He's pretty angry. But it was satisfied. Not because the man was gonna be able to repay it. Remember, this has nothing, like the, the king knew that he wasn't going to be able to repay it and the servant knew that he wasn't going to be able uh, to repay it. In fact, look at verse 26. Like when you see verse 26, uh, the servant falls on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. When both the king and the servant know that's a complete lie. Nobody's getting their money back in this situation. Unless the king sells him as a slave and, and, and his wife and kids and everything he has. And yet the king decides in his mercy to let this servant off the hook. Now let's go to the other servant. Now let's go to the other one. 
Okay? The other servant, we're told, uh, owes, uh, owes our bad guy. He owes him 100 denarii, or a denarii is what's used as a, as a term to describe a day's worth of wages, right? So 100 days worth of wages. So just think, like, just short of, like, a third of what you would make in a year is what you owe, which would still be a substantial amount of money, correct? I mean, that would be a lot. That would hurt If you were under that much debt to someone, you would feel it. It would be a stressor on your life. It's something you could, like, probably repay, though, if you were in a pinch. Like, you could could sell some things. You could probably sell a car. You could could do some things to try to get some of that money together. But you're you're probably going to need a little bit of time. And yet our servant says, nope, I need it right now. And if you don't pay me, I'm throwing you in jail. And that's exactly what he does. See, this servant, forgiven of 3.48 billion, the one who owes something that maybe is like sustained, you know, like I can get there, I could get to that, is shown no mercy. That wrath is fulfilled by throwing that one in jail. But I don't want us to lose sight of something very uh, crucial to this story, and it's this, is that neither one of these men deserve to have their debt paid. Like, none, none of these men deserve to just have, like, hey, uh, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm thinking if someone, if, if someone owed me a year, like, a third of the, like, a year's worth of my wages, like, I would probably need that money. <laughs> right? Again, I wouldn't be able to just fork that out at one time. It probably, for me, it would have been, like, a series of, like, hey, I need 100 bucks. Hey, I need 1000 and my car's broke. I got to do something. You know what I mean? Like, there's all these kind of things that we would borrow money for. And it gets to a point where you're just, like, kind of in over your head. And maybe that's where these guys are. But neither one of them deserve to have their debt forgiven. All right? Even though the amount was smaller, it still wasn't just like, hey, I need five bucks to get a cheeseburger. This is a, this is. This this is a lot of money that we're talking about. And neither man deserves to have their debt forgiven. But let's remember who Jesus is talking to in this parable. Let's let's go backwards just a little bit and see who is Jesus telling this story to. Well, we see earlier in the chapter, in chapter 18, at the beginning, that he is talking to his disciples. And his disciples have just got done asking him a question about who is going to be the greatest. Like, hey, when we get to heaven, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus uses that opportunity. He doesn't just say, you know, it's going to be God, it's going to be me. He instead, he goes and asks, summons for a little child to come to him. And he says that you have to come to him like a child if you want to experience anything in the kingdom of heaven. You have to humble yourself. And then later on in the chapter, in verse 15, um, we get these instructions on how to correct a fellow brother in Christ. In fact, you might recognize this passage we're about to read as a passage that often gets used whenever um, someone is uh, going through some sort of church discipline. And maybe you've heard that term before, and maybe you've experienced someone going through church discipline. Maybe you have been on the receiving end of some church discipline, or maybe you've just like heard about that and think it's weird, and you don't really kind of understand it. Well, this passage a lot of time is what we go to as a model on how to actually carry out church discipline. And so I want to read it um, as it pertains to this story, okay? So we're going to start in verse 15, um, And it says this, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Uh, But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. And we read that and we're like, okay, perfect. That means we have an out. Like, okay, somebody does something wrong to me, I go to them in person. Tough, but I can do it. Awesome. If they don't make it right, okay, then I'm going to take one or two others with me. I'm going to take a church elder with me, and we're going to go, and we're going to, like, we're going to go make this right. If they still continue to do the same thing, then we're going to take it, and we're going to bring it before the church. And they're going to come up here, and they're going to get embarrassed in front of the church. And then if they still don't repent, then I get to cast them off. They're a Gentile. They're a tax collector. They're outside there. I don't have to deal with it anymore. And I think that's maybe how we wish this passage is supposed to be interpreted. 
In fact, there's another spot in the Bible where, uh, where Jesus is asked how many times they're supposed to forgive someone, and Jesus tells them 70 times 70, or seven times 70, right? Which you do the math on that 490 times, and I think sometimes like internally we go, yes, sweet, I'm gonna start keeping track, and as soon as we get to 491, they're done. Okay, it's a lot, I can put up with it. As long as I've got a finish line. And yet, but that's not what this passage says. It says you get to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. How did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? This is the beautiful part. This is the beautiful part of this story. Jesus went to the Gentiles and the tax collectors. He went and he met with them. He spent his time with them. He went and shared meals with them. In fact, so much so that the other church people would see Jesus interacting with all of these sinners and say, why does your leader have meals and sit down with Gentiles and tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus gives us that answer even a few verses earlier in chapter 18. Let's go backwards just a few more verses in verse 12. It says this. You might recognize this passage. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. How are you supposed to treat a Gentile, a tax collector, and a sinner? As someone who needs to be rescued, someone who needs the love and acceptance of Jesus Christ. I used to work at a Verizon Wireless, and and my manager there at Verizon, he had this saying, like whenever someone was kind of acting up or or was about to get fired or he was about to go fire somebody, um, he liked to kind of joke about it with us beforehand, and he said, hey, that person's about to get a promotion to customer. Right. The implication being, right, we treat our customers way better than we treat our, our employees. Right? So let's think about that when it's the family of Christ. Right? How are we supposed to treat the people outside of the walls of here? As sheep who need to be rescued. As people in desperate need of God's love and forgiveness. Now, I know whenever we do a message like this and we start talking about forgiveness, there's all kinds of things that come to mind. And there's probably something in your mind, a wrong that has been done to you uh, that you cannot imagine ever forgiving that person for. And I'm not talking about like abuse. I'm not talking like, I'm not saying you just forget these things that happened. I'm not saying you just automatically let that person back into your life and like, all right, I've forgiven you. Let's go, let's, all right, come on, let's have dinner. That's not what I'm saying. Did the king forget that there was a debt owed to him that he had forgiven? No, but he had forgiven it. Even though the guy didn't deserve it. And here's the deal. If your forgiveness, like if if you're waiting to forgive someone, like if the question is to you, does this person deserve to be forgiven? The answer is always going to be no. Do they deserve to be forgiven? No. And guess what? You're right. That person who wronged you, that person who did that thing against you, that person who sinned against you does not deserve to be forgiven. And guess what? Just like you. And just like me. Because here's what we like to do with a story like this. We see these two we see, we see these two servants with a debt, and we automatically will place ourselves in the place of the servant who just owned the smaller debt, right? Like, I've, I'm a sinner, yep, I'll admit that. I've done some stuff wrong, but I'm not that guy. I've got like some stuff that I mess up from time to time, but my debt is way smaller. It's manageable, like I can handle it. And we look at this person with the 3.48 billion worth of sin debt, and we're like, that guy really needs some forgiveness. They don't deserve it. But did this guy deserve it either? No. 
And each and every single one of us owe a sin debt. And we are way closer to the 3.48 billion. Like, I want you to, like, be picturing that. There is nothing you could do to repay your sin debt. Nothing. You could live 100 lifetimes and never do enough good to repay your 3.48 billion worth of sin debt. And maybe that feels daunting to you, but I hope this morning it feels incredibly liberating. That it's not up to you. You don't deserve it. You never will deserve forgiveness. You will never deserve to have that debt wiped clean. And yet Jesus went to the cross and did it anyway. Man, that is good news. And that's why we call it the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're the 100 denarii sin debt or the 3.48 billion sin debt or anywhere in between or on the other side of it. Jesus went to the cross and forgave it. And here's my favorite part of the gospel, is Jesus paid that debt knowing full well that like if you were to accept Jesus Christ today, ask God to forgive you of all your sins and place your faith and trust in Jesus right here today, he knows full well that you're gonna borrow against that sin debt again in probably about five minutes. And yet he did it anyway. And I firmly believe that if he had to do it all over again today, he would. He would go to the cross a million times if that's what it took, but it only took one time. It only took Jesus living one perfect, sinless life, going to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin that we could never pay. And then he rose again in three days to prove that he was stronger than any sin debt you will ever owe. And he rose again and he lives today in heaven. And he will come again for his followers, for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus. So if you're a kid here today, if you're a kid, I want you to hear. This, this is what I want you to leave with. There is no sin that you will ever commit. There is no sin that you have ever committed that is too big for Jesus to pay that debt. His work on the cross, what he did by dying on the cross was enough to pay for your sin that you've committed now and every sin you will ever commit. Adults, here's your lesson for today. There is no amount of sin that you could have ever committed and that you ever will commit that is too big for the love of Jesus to pay. Your debt can be wiped clean if you will place your faith and trust in Jesus. And it doesn't matter how many times you borrow against that sin debt. It doesn't matter how many times you've messed up. It doesn't matter knowing full well that you're probably going to mess up on that same sin that you keep messing up on over and over and over again. Maybe you feel like eventually like Jesus is just gonna get tired of forgiving you that same thing. Like he's up in heaven counting to 491 so that he doesn't have to forgive you anymore. And yet Jesus is telling you, look, I died for 491 and every sin past that, that debt is wiped clean. And so maybe this morning you need to start by forgiving yourself. Stop holding things against yourself that Jesus isn't. Maybe you need to come to the cross. You need to come to him and just repent. Tell him again, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. Whatever that is for you this morning, whether, it is, whether you would like to place your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time this morning, man, I wish you would. And so does Jesus. Remember verse 14, it tells us that it is God's hope that every single one of his little children would come to him. And so this morning you can. We're gonna have decision counselors up here at the front, okay? They're gonna be on the sides. You know, we're not even asking you to like come down the middle so you can, you know, feel like everybody's eyes are just focused on you. They're not, they're not gonna be. They're not gonna be. But some of you, maybe you just need to ask somebody to pray with you. Come down here and pray with one of our decision counselors. Some, just do some business with the Lord. If you need to ask the forgiveness for something, uh, do it. If you need to forgive someone in your life for something that you've been holding against them for some time, do it. Whatever that is for you, just do business, 
all right? And we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing together. We're gonna sing a song called Waymaker. And let me tell you, going to kids camp last week and getting to lead worship with all of your kids uh, was just such a fun experience. And, you know, you get to do all like the silly songs with all the motions and they yell and they just have a great time and it's awesome. Like it's super fun. Um, But let me tell you, there is no noise like the noise of 160 kids screaming Waymaker at the top of their lungs because they believe it like a child. They have the faith of a child to come to their father and know that their father has made a way for them to have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let's stand. Let's respond to the good news of the gospel this morning with worship. Come on.